Before we start, a few disclaimers. This is not a short and clean list of everything that has happened in Braceboard so far. There's a link to that in written form in the description. It is also not a quick recap to get you up to date with the most important characters and events. This is a long form retelling of everything that has happened in Braceboard up until now. It's not exhaustive because that would literally take days, but I think I read all the most important bits. It's meant to be a thing you can put in the background and just consume passively. If you actually already are or are going to get into baseball, please subscribe and check out this channel's videos. I've made and will make a lot of baseball content. Oh, and if you don't know how baseball proper works, don't worry, I didn't either, I still really don't. A quick glance at a simple explanatory article, like those I've linked in the description, should be enough. You don't need any of the more complex rules, or you can just pick it up as you go along, like I did. So, what is Braceball? Braceball is many things. Braceball is a website where you can view the simulated games of a fantasy baseball league in which Broad and Peanuts reign, frequent cracks in the fabric of reality interrupt play, and monstrous umpires regularly incinerate prayers under the eclipse of a second sun. Braceball is also the act of talking about Braceball and engaging with it in any meaningful way. The simulation and the way we interact with it are both Braceball, and Braceball wouldn't exist without the interplay of these two parts. You see a cool play by someone with a cool name. You think, oh, they're really cool, I like them. Then they get incinerated or the clones start appearing all over the field or they start being invited by the ghosts of past dead prayers and you're like, Damn. I wonder how their team feels about it. I wonder how the league feels about it and I wonder what this means for Bracewars at all and what even is this prayer? A dog? A tree? Hot water geyser? Any answer you come up to any of these questions might just be valid. Braceball is an exercise in community building by way of collaborative storytelling. The fan art, fan fiction, fan lore, stadium chants, even just hanging out in a team's chat, that is as much a part of the game as is the simulation itself. You may think of it as a role-playing game with the simulation and the developers as game masters, and the fans as tens of thousands of players spread out all over the world. Well, now it's tens of thousands. When the game first launched, on the 20th of July 2020, I'm not sure it had anything more than a few hundred players. It was a small side project for the game band, a Los Angeles indie studio, mostly focused on the incoming release of an actual fake puzzle game. Experiencing the sport as something transfigured into an absurd digital form rhymed perfectly with the equally absurd and more or less equally digital lives of those stuck inside during the pandemic. Baseball is baseball at your mercy, baseball perfected, reads the opening screen before you join. Our players are inhuman, they play day and night, rain or shine, they never go sick, they never tire, and the basic draw, democracy returns to the national pastime. Each week you want to remake the league in your own image, everything from rules to rosters is in your hands. All games offer a kind of fantasy, and just when everything, everything careened out of control, Braceball offered something nothing else really did, the fantasy that what you want actually matters. And so it grew, and grew, and grew. After not even six months, the player numbers easily veered into double digit thousands, possibly even the triple digits. It was too much for more indie team to handle, at least if they wanted to maintain their sanity and the level of quality the game quickly made itself known for. So there were glitches and outages and pauses in the regular proceedings of the game, or siestas. The one which, as of the time of writing, is about to end, is but the latest and biggest. However, to the game's credit, in the end none of this really mattered. It even added to the experience, like the cracking of vinyls or VHS artifacts can make an old album or movie feel more real. The glitchiness and jankiness gives it a dreamlike substance, a shapeless and pliable form in which everything can be stamped. This is just a fancy way to say that early Braceball was broken. We hardly even know exactly what happened in Season 1. Researching it feels like discovering some new kind of archaeology I'm ashamed that fans have invented. Feels like remembering some image or story or event that you saw on the internet ages ago and of which you only have past circumstantial details. So you keep googling and digging and looking into the funked forums and old Facebook profiles and MySpace accounts and after a while you're like, whoa, did that really happen? Did it? Believe it or not, Braceball wasn't very weird in Season 1. Yeah, sure, you had some strangely named teams and players in this fantasy baseball league. 
and the game's official Twitter account is that annoying thing bands do where they pretend they're part of the joke, you know, in with the cool kids, so to speak. But that was it. You have three bases, 14 players per team, whoever has more runs wins, normal stuff. Players had a star rating which was supposed to affect their skill and most of the time did so. You could bet on games as you can in a lot of other virtual sports, except one thing. At the end of each baseball season, there are directions. Remember, what you want matters, and this is how you can make your voice heard. Much like in real life democracies, gold are the cash in Francis would actually passes. Players can use the in-game currency they earn from betting to buy votes, and those votes can be cast on the crease. They are the fundamental way for players to influence the simulation. They are the parts of the RPG where you decide how you will change the game's world, just without all the grinding and questing and fighting in between. One of them, in season 1, was simply called Open the Forbidden Book. The description said it is forbidden. And come on, how could the fans not open that Pandora's box, eat that literally forbidden fruit? The Philadelphia Pies easily won the first Baseball Internet League Championship. After that, the elections happened, the votes were counted, and, as a direct consequence of what the fans did, purely to see what would happen, everything fell apart. Braceball is intentionally cryptic about everything, really. You could say it's the dark souls of fantasy baseball simulators, in that sense. The Forbidden Book turned out to be the game's version of an instruction manual. Around 90% of it is redacted, a lot of what is not appears to be entirely meaningless, and it hardly ever reveals anything useful. In Season 2, it mentioned that a regular season lasts 99 games, every game lasts 1 hour, and if it goes over, there is spillover and all subsequent games are delayed. It also said that the league is divided into two sub-leagues and four divisions, Raffle Good and Chaotic Good, Chaotic Evil and Raffle Evil. Seasons start on a Monday and end on a Friday, then there's playoffs on Saturday which are in a best of five format between the four top teams in each sub-league. It also related a special condition called Shame. If the home team scores the winning run in the bottom of the final inning, the away team must complete the game in Shame, the threat being mathematically eliminated. We had already figured out most, if not all, of those things by simply observing the game, but the book also showed what appeared to be a win condition, so to speak, for baseball. I quote, if a team wins three championships, they and baseball shall ascend. What does that mean? We didn't know. But we eventually learned, and you too will by the end of this video. A common theme to all, literally all of baseball is the concept of hubris, or Pandora's box, or fuck around and find out. The fans do something that they clearly should not do. Then it goes incredibly wrong in ways they could not even imagine and are left to pick up the pieces and make sad fanfiction about how gay the new dead or shadowed or the encased in giant mute shell sprayers are. This concept first made itself evident in the opening of the Forbidden Book. It meant the Moab sunbeams had their own desert swallowed by the air mount. No one knows what the air mount is or why this change it the sunbeam specifically. It also meant the best feature in the league. Jerry and Hot Dog Fingers was instantly incinerated as punishment. Not only that, but solar eclipses started happening. Under them, other players could, and would, suffer Jerry's fate. The Discipline Era had started. And not on terminology, the Discipline Era proper only starts at the end of Season 1, with the opening of the Forbidden Book, and ends with Season 10, but I personally consider everything from Season 1 to 11 as the Discipline Era, and I will be mostly using that definition to the video. When I mean the Discipline Era proper, I will specify so. Alongside the crease, there are blessings. They can be thought of as less powerful decrees, which are randomly given out to a team in the league through a proportional raffle system. For example, if a team has 10% of the total votes for a given blessing, they have a 10% chance of winning it. So teams with more fans that can marshal more votes are naturally favored. Generally speaking, especially as the seasons progress, you will see teams with big fan bases get stronger and teams with small ones get weaker. But it's more like a tendency than a hard rule. In season 1, these dynamics weren't really present yet. The game had a few hundred at best fans. It was uncharted territory, and some of baseball's most important characters got their start here with the season 1 blessings. Porkerot Patterson, a middling player for the Brett Means, received the max out pitcher blessing, was stolen by the Baltimore Cubs, and would eventually become the greatest pitcher in baseball history. Jessica Telephone, batter for the Dallas Stakes, received the equivalent max out batter blessing and was stolen by the Philadelphia Pies, fresh off a championship win. She would become one of the most beloved players in baseball and one of its most accomplished batters. 
Finally, for reasons unknown to us, but Nagomi Mekdenia went from the Breckenridge Jet Science to the Away Fridays. Nagomi is the second greatest battery in baseball history. You could even say the best, depending on what metrics you value most. She would eventually lead a team, I will not tell you which one, yet, to Ascension. More generally, two teams won the most blessings. The Baltimore Cubs and the 80s Tigers each scored two of the eight on offer. The Tigers were a good team, now serious title contenders, but the Cubs were one of the absolute worst, placing second by win-loss ratio, and it would take a lot more than that for them to be even remotely competitive. Remember this image. These are the Baltimore Cubs at the end of Season 1. Remember it. Those two teams, alongside the Season 1 championship winners, the Philadelphia Pies, and the, for now, somewhat between Charleston Shooters and Seattle Garages, would become the five most accomplished teams in baseball history and play pivotal roles in the course of the game. But none of them, none, will influence the game as much as the absolute worst baseball team ever. The Los Angeles Tacos. That is the beauty of this game. Even if you absolutely suck, basically never make playoffs or win buffs or have good luck, you too can be a constituent part of the experience. Baseball is a horror game. There is a popular thread on the Baseball subreddit which suggests a radical new rule to make baseball interesting again. Whenever a player strikes out, there is a small chance, about 1 in 40,000, that the umpire pulls out a gun and shoots him. The response was overwhelmingly positive. And baseball, showing just how superior it is to that other sport, works a bit like that. Under Eclipse weather, umpires have a random chance to go rogue and incinerate a random player. It's not particularly common. Batters, during an average season, if they play it in full, have only, well, only a 1.5% chance of being incinerated. That's because Eclipse is usually just one of the many weather types present. Season 2 is not your usual season. Eclipse was the first weather type introduced, so all games happened under it. As a result, Season 2 became the second most deadly one in baseball history. It's not really remembered as such. We have a full blown out musical about the death of a single player which happened in Season 7, but not even a word about Jenna Maldonado or Lars Mendoza, who died in Season 2, just to pick two at random. It feels cruel, but it makes sense. No one really cared about these characters yet. But the replacement for one Jesse Wise, butter for the away Fridays, was four star York Cirque. York would, in the season 2 elections, receive the Gumbraid blessing and have his stats maximized, becoming over time another contender for the title of best baseball butter ever. York is an absolute superstar, with lots of fan art and a dedicated following. Jesse Wise has maybe three sentences in their wiki page, and their death was immortalized by the commissioner shilling for the league's sponsor a coffee company and the hashtag no one posted on, but they mattered, you know? They put their foot down on the plate and suffered the consequences. It happened to them, but it could happen to anyone else, to York himself even, to Jessica, to Nagomi. The Pies won again, threading to ascend literally as soon as possible. In the elections, another ominously named decree, Peanuts passed and did nothing, best we could tell. The description just said, Peanuts. There were a few shuffles, the Tigers saw Jessica Telefon, the Tigers battered on. York was, as I mentioned, maximized, and so was pitcher Axel Torolog of the Chicago Firefighters. Axel is probably the only maximized player who doesn't really rank that high in the list of best pitchers or batters. Maybe not even top 10. I won't go too in-depth about why here, I've already made a video about that, among other things. Check it out. In Season 3, things get really, really weird. Here's a few weird Season 3 facts. We are the Season 3 fact number 1. In Season 2, 100% of the games were played under a deep sweater, leading to a total of 17 incinerations. In Season 3, two new weather types were introduced, peanuts and birds, so only 18% of the season's games were under eclipse, leading to 28 deaths. We don't know why. Maybe the developers adjusted the simulation, but I don't see why they would and they certainly didn't keep up the increased rate going forward. Maybe it's just random chance. Either way, this is the deadliest season in baseball history. We are the season 3 fact number 2. So, remember the Peanuts decree? It resulted in a new currency, Peanuts, being added, three players having the dumb part of their names changed to Peanut, and, as I've said, two new kinds of weather. Peanut weather, under which Peanuts rain, and the bird weather, under which birds just fly around and cause ominous messages to appear in the game log. Oh, at least, that's all we knew back then. Players can eat stray peanuts under peanut weather, which either boosts or reduces their player attributes by 
So usually a one or a one and a half star change in either direction depending on the rounding. Whether they get a yummy or an allergic reaction depends entirely on them being, well, allergic to peanuts. We can see if they are, but I'm not supposed to tell you. That's forbidden knowledge, that is, knowledge about the game that's not publicly shown by the game itself. Think of the data mining speedrunners do to understand how to get a new record. It's not cheating, you're not really gaining any unfair advantage, the developers are perfectly aware that it's a thing as fans do and they encourage us to enjoy the game however we want. They know how to hide the really important stuff anyway. But since knowing how the game works under the hood, where the magician keeps his rabbit, so to speak, may be something that ruins your enjoyment of the game, official policy is to let people decide by themselves whether to pursue the forbidden arts or not. So they didn't them like spoilers for a movie or game. And that's what I will do in the course of this video. Anyway, we are the season 3 fact number 3. Players were supposed to eat, collectively, 1 million peanuts to atone for having opened the forbidden book. That meant buying peanuts with your hard-earned cash and clicking on a little icon to eat them. You wait for the animation to finish and click again, and again, and again, and again. A perverse imitation of Cookie Clicker in our absurdist cosmic horror fantasy baseball simulation game thing. It was possible, I'm sure, but we'll never know, because the old thing fell apart later the day it was introduced. Some players found some kind of bug that let them give themselves infinite peanuts and coins, and they tried to abuse it. This event was dubbed the peanut fraud. The developers paused the game and gave the cheaters a chance to come forward. When that did not happen, they did the most reasonable thing game developers should do to counter cheating. They displayed a giant, floating, rotating peanut icon with the word blasphemy in all caps under it in place of our dear Braceford. This would be the first appearance of the game's main villain, the Shelled One, or the Peanut God as the fans started calling it. This thing, this monster, has done the second most damage to everything baseball fans hold dear. After the fans themselves, of course. Following this ominous appearance of the shared one, the price of peanuts was set to 1 million coins, unattainable by legal means, and the collective target of eating 1 million peanuts was removed, leaving only uncertainty. <sighs> we are the season 3 fact number 4. During a game between the shoot thieves and the tacos on day 73, or August 6, reality broke. Well, the simulation did. The website reported an error. But the devs clearly had the peanut display ready and, to their credit, integrated the bug into the game's lore without skipping a beat. The shared one appeared again, told us we were insatiable and asked us if we had tasted the infinite, realistic salty about the peanut fraud. Since the last recorded game event had been a grand slam by Divis Butter, Mauro Dory, against Peach and Reed Davenport, the event was later called the Grand Unslam and credited as what had actually broken in reality. In fact, in the season 3 elections, this event was directly referenced as such. The Los Angeles Tacos, the worst team in the league, had been affected in some way by the Anselm. Their name was changed to the Unlimited Tacos. Los Angeles split into the many cities of Los Angeles or Los Angeles. And after the season 3 election results, all Tacos players were named to Wyatt Mason. Wyatt Mason Prime, let's say, had been before one of the worst battles in the league and a truly unremarkable player. Now, everyone was Wyatt Mason. Why? We actually do know, because we asked the devs in a Q&A, but I'm not going to tell you because I would like you to feel as confused as we did back then. Link to the Q&A is in the description, I suggest checking it out only after the video's done. Ultimately, though, it's up to you, you're free to take part in a cultural event of baseball however you wish. But, apart from this weirdness, play continued. The Pies, having lost Jessica at the time their best batter in the league, were beaten by a new team, the Eddies Tigers. The Tigers later won the title, but they lost batter Randy Valens to incineration in the second game of the final series. Randy's death was so narratively satisfying it's like it was scripted. His death turned around the final series and propelled the Tigers to victory. Randy was a favorite across the whole league. After his death, fans started using Rest in Valens or R.I.P. instead of Rest in Peace when players died, and they still do to this day. I've been following the game loosely since early season 3, and this death and the community's reaction to it was what convinced me to actually get involved in it. Season 3's selections weren't nearly as earth shattering as the previous two, or at least didn't appear so at the time. To the Chris past, Hit the Rich and Interviews. Hit the Rich simply amended the book so that the coin wealth of the 1% richest players would be distributed to 99% at the end of each season. Interviews for once did exactly what we wanted it to do. It gave us a lot of random information about the players, some of it useful and some not. It told us their pre-game rituals, their star scream, their base running and defense stars, their blood type, their fate and their evolution. 
to this day, more than half a year after the fact, we have no idea what relevance, if any, half of this have to the game. Interviews is the first decree I personally ever voted for, back when I only loosely followed the baseball and had set the Houston of Pies as my home team because they had a cool logo and color. I later, as I said, joined the Tigers and have never looked back. There was an extended pause, or siesta as the commissioner called it, after season 3 because have you looked at baseball in season 3? Everything was on fire. I imagine the servers were landing on shooting gum and paper clippers. The devs needed some time to make sure the game actually worked fine, or like, worked at all. It had quickly grown past their initial expectations, and the live games are very complicated to run. But while I suspect they could have kept it running in its sorry state to like in their sponsor and Patreon money, they've always been committed to offering the best possible absolutist fantasy baseball simulation on the market, so they took some time to rework on what was to come. That involved fixing the fact that literally every player in the former Los Angeles Tigers, now a limited Tigers rotation, was now inexplicably named Wyatt Mason. The commissioner looked at that mess and thought, as one does, Wow, that's a hashtag brand, hashtag opportunity, hashtag goals, hashtag brand goals, hashtag product, engagement, hashtag, and decided to do it live on Twitter. By do it live on Twitter, I mean that he tweeted out the names of every Wyatt Mason player, and you had to like or retweet each message a number of times to reset them to their normal names. Likes for the sound names, retweets for the names proper. It worked out well enough. To this day, Wyatt and Mason are still some of the most popular names in baseball, but there is no one named exactly Wyatt Mason. Wyatt Mason Prime, the original, was renamed simply to NAN, NAN, which is short for not a number in computer speak, or could also be a pun to mean name not available, I guess. NAN is the worst batter in baseball history by career statistics and has one of the most important characters in the game. He technically shouldn't even exist and everyone loves him. But the Twitter shenanigans didn't stop there. A few days before season 4 started, the commissioner followed an account called simply the microphone, username at the baseball mic. It tweeted short, cryptic messages in weird fonts that appeared at least tangentially related to baseball, and it claimed to be Wyatt, or, well, Wyatt's, plural. Somehow, to the chaos of the Grand Slam, Wyatt Mason had made its way to a place hundred times more sour tragic, chaotic, and existential annihilating than baseball. Twitter. And it did what all of us are condemned to do. It busted. A microphone being rifted was referenced in the Season 3 election results, and a new weather type introduced in Season 4 was called Feedback, which is what you call a kind of audio issue that can happen when working with microphones and digital audio in general. Under Feedback Weather, players can switch places from one team to another. It's a much less destructive kind of weather than incinerations, and would, during the course of the following seasons, be the engine of many, many stories. On day 88, the game broke again. Well, to be fair, it was apparently an issue with the servers, not on baseball sand. At least I don't think so. But either way, the simulation had to be rolled back about 8 hours to around day 80. During these 8 lost days, feature Thomas England of the Away Fridays had been incinerated, and replaced by six-pack Dog Walker. But when the game was sold back, England was nowhere to be seen. They had been completely deleted, and are to this day the only former player that we know of to have no record of their existence left anywhere in the game. All other dead players are somewhere, I won't tell you where yet. But Thomas England just disappeared. That's why I wanted to mention him in this video. Thomas England only exists in the players' memories, a footnote on the wiki or in the external tools we made to track the game. Well, that's not true, there is something of him left. Six Pack Dog Walker was given a unique bat, bangers and mash, which sounds like what an American thinks English people call everything they eat. As far as baseball is concerned, that is the only sign that Thomas England has ever existed. Six Pack's pre-game ritual was changed to talking to the microphone, and the microphone indeed tweeted, telling Six Pack to warn them, them being the players, as fans, we don't know, alongside mentioning shared and an it which wants to punish us or something of the sort. What else? On day 108, August 29, during round 2, game 4, between the New York Millennials and the Chicago Firefighters, Thomas the Arcana hit a ground out to Eric Tosser. The Tigers won their second championship, the fighter losing Jessica Telephone earlier in the season to feedback. She returned to her previous team, the Philadelphia Pies, who would hold on to her, in one form or another, for the next 5 seasons. The alternate reality and fourth strike decrease fast. The former simply allowed the stats of random players throughout the league. Especially hurting the Miami Dyers pitcher Rivers Crambons and the Tigers' Yatsui Mason, who both went from two of the best in the league to two of the worst. The latter gave the bottom four teams a fourth strike on each plate appearance. 
Season 5 is arguably the least consequential in baseball history. A new weather revive appeals. It has a chance to shuffle players' positions on their team. A pitcher becomes a batter, a batter goes from 15 in the run up to 11th, all multiple players are affected in a similar way. It can also assign a particular modification called reverberating, but it's very rare and has only happened once, the rover sets Don Mitchell. Season 4 started at reality pressing at the tires out, with Yatsu and Mason going from 5 stars to half star. They struggled in playoffs, leading their level the Jets Sands and the Firefighters to drag it out in the finals, with the Fighters winning their first title. The Paris were also in a slump. Finally, there was no really, truly dominant team. The Fighters were good, but not as good as the Paris or Tigers had been. Finally, the fans thought, finally, everyone has a chance. It's gonna be a long time before we see a team truly dominate the IRB. Elections came up, a decree passed which organized the leagues and divisions based on win-loss ratio, and... The story of the second half of the discipline era is, in many ways, the story of the Baltimore Cubs. They won the four best blessings on offer and became the team to beat. Following stars gave four players one star in each category. A 6% overall boost from rollback netcode adds a bit rest on one star per player spread out all over the stats. All the hallucinations gave them 17% base running for around 10 stars across the whole team. They also stole Axel to a roll from the Chicago Firefighters and sent back Joshua Watson for a raw star gain of about 26 stars. In baseball, a season with 65 wins is considered excellent, between 60 and 65 very good, 50 to 60 above average. The 70 wins ceiling has been broken only 5 times. The team that did it were the Baltimore Cubs, the Baltimore Cubs, the Dallas Stakes, the Baltimore Cubs and the Eddie Tigers. The team was especially good in two areas, base running and defense, and their all-star pitching rotation combined with the team's high average defense made them almost impossible to score against. A lot of really good players popping up in Season 6 was pretty appropriate. A new mechanic introduced that season had fans choose one player to idolize. Fans would get coins for each hit and normal if their idol was a batter, or a strikeout and shutout if they were a pitcher. There was also a leaderboard for the most idolized players. Predictably, Jesse Adrefon and Nagomi McDaniels, some of the best batters in the league, topped it. Alongside Porkout Patterson, York Sirk and Axel Torol. But the appearance of what the game scored called an ominous red line on the board, cutting off the top 3 spots, complicated things. The Pinot God, at the end of the past season, had asked us to idolize its progeny, whatever that meant. Remember the three players whose names had been changed to have Pinot in it? Well, we put two and two together and came up with what we call the Pinot Friend. Get Pinot Born, Pinot Yardaffi, Pinot Holloway in the top three spots of the other board. However, it didn't quite work out that way. Something complicated the matter and led to possibly the single most important decision the fans ever made in days of baseball after the opening of the Forbidden Book. The story of the second half of the discipline era is also, in many ways, the story of Jerry and Otto Fingers. On season 6, the 31, batter Carigua Lotus of the Boston Flowers was incinerated. She was quite popular within the team and quite a few forwards fans had been idolizing her. One of them realized that not only dying did not remove her from the pool of available idols, but you could directly access the player's page by clicking on the idol button and share the link so that others, too, would be able to idolize the dead player. So far, everyone had thought we could only select as idols players to fed in the game's as public interfaces, the team view, the game view, and so on. This was reported as a bug, but the developers confirmed it wasn't one. A most talkers fan put down a list of player IDs a group of fans, Cibor or the Society for Internet Baseball Research, had been logging as part of a broad baseball archiving and research effort. With this list, he was able to access the page of every single baseball player ever tracked by Cibor database and idolized them. And so could anyone else with a simple link. Within half an hour, Cibor decided to idolize Jerry Not Dog Fingers and get her on the other board just to see what would happen. They chose her because she was the first to ever be incinerated, so a perfect pick for the all of the league to rally behind. They brought this up to the talkers, who happily went along with it. They had just lost everyone's favorite player and best friend, John Tratomorphy, Axel, Richmond, Harrison, to feedback, so they were in the mood to fight the baseball gods. They contacted their former team, the Garages, and the Flowers, who had learned of this friend, also decided to join in. By the top of the hour, everyone knew of this friend, and Jaren was on third 20 of the idol board and there was an icon, a framing scar, right next to her name. Probably a little easter egg the developers put in, just in case a player on the idol board was incinerated. I don't think they expected this, and I don't think they expected what would happen next. The fans also realized that one blessing available for the season 6 selections was Lottery Peak. The team which won it would steal the player on the 14th spot of the idol board. 
we once again put two and two together and the Moist Talkers fan Twitter basically spelled it out. The commissioner replied to a tweet with a simple, are you sure? Uh, yes, yes we were. I remember waiting for the game to end before going straight to idolizing Jaren. But you can only idolize one player, so the Jaren brand and the Pinot brand kind of split our focus. Some people also did not want to follow the Pinot disorders. After all, it was just some random big review in the sky who mostly gave allergic reactions to our beloved players and patronized us. Overall, we tried to balance the two best we could. Some absolute moron even came up with the idea of calling the old Necromancy and Pinots in the top 3 spots brand the Necronut brand. Necronut brand. You know, because Necromancy and Pinots, Necronut. Anyway, I can't believe it got on. Anyway, this particular moment, Caligula Lotus getting incinerated and a few fans going, oh, wait, what if? Then the old rig laying behind the revival of Jaren or Tog Fingers, this is where everything goes off the rails. This is the inflection point. I can't even imagine how different baseball would be if we had not done this. The garages were on the upswing. The comments were well underway to bring in the beloved Jaren back. They were releasing albums at an alarming rate. Oh, did I not mention that the Garages fans have an actual record label and they make baseball themed music? Check it out, link in the description. And they swept two time IAB champions the Edis Tigers and Philadelphia Pies on their way to the finals. They met the powers that the Baltimore Cubs had become. For a moment, for just a moment, it seemed like the Garages could do it. I guess all odds, it seemed like they could beat the Cubs and go into season 7 victorious with a title under their belt. Then they got swept. It wasn't even close. The Baltimore Cubs, in fact, did not lose a single game during the playoffs, but when the election results came in, the garages had reason enough to be happy. The worst pitcher in the rotation, Mike Townsend, was sent to the shadows. There's a whole video to be made about terrible pitchers like Mike and what they mean to their team, but this is not the one. For now, let's just say that the garages fan base had a trouble this with Mike, but they eventually came to love him, and him leaving to let Jaren come back was seen as a redemption arc. So goodbye, Mike, and welcome back, Jaren. Oh, and the Pinot brand didn't really work out. The Jessica Telephone fan base was too big, as was the Nagomi McDaniels one. We only got one of the three players we wanted in the top three. The direct pitcher, Pinot Pong. The Pinot God appeared and quite liked our Tog Fingers trick. But it did not like how we did not get all three of its progeny at the top. It proclaimed no half measures before encrossing Jessica and Nagomi into giant Pinot shells. <sighs> Welcome to baseball. We're about halfway through. That was the easy part, the normal part. Now it gets weird. I'm not gonna say the simulation is a better writer than most in video games or movies or anything, and I recognize that there are actual real good writers that TGB would have it best they can, but season 7 was such a perfect low point for the discipline era. This is the part of the movie where the protagonist is tied up and then got over a pool of alligators, or where the love of their life disappears and it looks like it's all over. Jaren came back with two traits, or modifications as they are called in the game's code, returned and debted. The first told us that Jaren had a chance to return to the void, to die again, that is, at the end of each season. The second simply said that this player must fulfill a debt. Either way, Jaren Otok Fingers hit the ground running in season 7. In her first appearance on the mound, in a day 5 game against the Kansas City Brett Mins, the Garages scored 20 runs, 14 of which all in the bottom of the 16th inning and she hit three main sprayers with the first record at distances of hit by pitches. Hit by pitches, or beam balls as they're commonly called, are thrown balls which hit a player. Typically the batter, but can be anyone else. Players she hit this way as with the Astable trait on their player page. We did not know what the Astable trait actually did. The description only told us it lasted a baseball week, which is 9 days for some reason. It would only take until day 32. She would be in 7 more players until then. Among them were A.D. Staggers Butters, Moody Cookbook and McLaughlin Scoffler. They were made a stable on day 30. On day 32, the A.D. Staggers played the game against the Canada Moist Stalkers under a keep sweater. At the top of the third inning, Moody Cookbook was incinerated, but not like all other players so far had. There was a unique message which directly referenced Jaren. A debt was collected, a rogue umpire incinerated the Tiger sitter Moody Cookbook, replaced by Carmilo Brahms. This ability spreads to the Moist Stalkers as Seraya Bates. At the bottom of the 16th inning, Elijah Bates was incinerated as well, and they stability spread to pitcher Yasmin Mason of the Tigers. The same fate struck Scorpler at the top of the 7th. Bates was replaced by Kiki Familia and Scorpler by Fraser Schmumke. 
The description for a stable updated, but we had already figured it out. A stable players had a much higher chance of being incinerated under Gibbs weather. That had just been the second game in a best of three series between the Talkers and Tigers. There was one game to go in it, still under a deep sweater with multiple players as stable. As soon as it started, at the top of the first inning, Kiki Familia was incinerated after having played for only five and a half innings with only two played appearances. She wasn't even a stable, it was just bad luck. But at the bottom of the second, Antonio Wallace, who actually was, died. These two games and the tragic events connected to them were later commonly called Ruby Tuesday by the Tigers at first, then the Talkers and later the whole league. Those were the first steps collected to challenge powers, but by no means the last. During all of Season 7, the following players died this way. Dominic MJ of the Millennials, Murray Pony of the Dali, Sebastian Telefon of the Stakes, Yatsmin Mason of the Tigers, Fraser Schwumger of the Tigers, Workman and Groom of the Canada Moist Talkers, Boyfriend Monerar of the Kansas City Brett Wings, and Miguel Wheeler of the Mexico City Wild Wings. Of these, Sebastian Telephone, Workman and Groom, and Boyfriend Monerar are particularly notable. Sebastian's story is super interesting, but outside of the scope of this recap. There has been a musical about it and also a Noiko video. Workman and Groom is the greatest contact battle in baseball history and died while eating Omer. I have also made a neat little video about him. Links to all of these as cards and in the description. The main speak pressing structure is that Boyfriend, an extremely good base runner and solid hitter, would end up first in the lineup and set up the following batters for scoring. This worked extremely well, after being a mediocre or bad team for most of their history. In season 7, the Mins made playoffs for the second time in their history and had the second most wins in the league thanks to his strategy. Boyfriend, however, died just before playoffs and was replaced by the absolutely terrible Pajo Nakamoto. That completely tanked the Mins. This was the highest number of incinerations the league had seen since season 3, and it was much worse than had a lot less players dying. We had grown attached to a lot of them. We simply hadn't really had the time to do so back in seasons 2 and 3. It also looked like it wasn't going to be the last tragedy to strike in season 7. The idol board now had the top 10 spots instead of the top 3 cut off by the ominous red line. This could have meant that, even with the peanut players in the top 3, seven other innocent players could have been shelled. The fanbase as a whole did not want that to happen. The Unlimited Tacos volunteered all five of their pitchers to be placed above the line. To their credit, they did so selflessly. Part of the argument was that since shelled players don't play at all, having their entire rotation shelled would either make them instantly lose all their games, which would be hilarious, or result in some other unexpected but entertaining outcome. And since they were the worst team in the league and had no chance of winning the championship, they did not mind blowing everything up. The entire league embraced this plan, called it the sacrifice, and it went along perfectly. It still left two spots. Star pitchers Axel Trollor and Polkadot Patterson filled them and were shelled. But the peanut god appeared satisfied. It showed up after the last game of the regular season, gave us 10,000 peanuts, mocked the sacrifice and shared the entire tackle's pitching rotation. But in all this, there was a bright spot. On day 63, Jessica Telephone was freed from her shell by a flock of birds under bird weather. That, so far, is the only known way to free shell players from their prison. A random event under bird's weather. After the peanut, however, another entity visited us. The Hull Monitor, as known simply as the Monitor or the Squid, because it's a squid. It speaks in lowercase and in blue, which is about 200 times less threatening than the peanut's all captured text, and means I fully expect the monitor to turn evil very, very soon. It mistook the peanut god for an egg, said it came here, to the Braceful League, by following Jaren from the hall and from the trench. We didn't know what either were, but we would learn about the first soon. It then said it would wait and see if that egg, the peanut, came back. While all this was happening, Season 7 also saw the most incredible underdog run in the history of baseball. Based on all you've heard so far, who do you think won Season 7? The fearsome Baltimore Cubs were stronger than everyone else in the league, the rejuvenated Philadelphia Pies with a fresh and shared Jessica Telephone, the Seattle Gargers with Jaren on a tray of death and destruction? No! They got damn Mexico City White Wings! I've mentioned them once in the video because they're bad. They have always placed in the bottom half or even bottom fifth of the league since season 1. In season 7, they made playoffs for the first time in their history, won the whole thing, never made playoffs ever again and slid back into obscurity. 
they did all this while the fans staged a Twitter trial because they were white but had ended up in the Mild League so the developers changed their name to Mild as a joke and they somehow beat the best teams in the league and there's a video to be made about how the white wing is on season 7 and I probably will one day. Like and subscribe if much to like and not if, if season 7 was the darkest moment Season 8 is the boss, the morning that comes after. The season's subtitle was, appropriately, Rest in Balance. Jaren's debt was refinanced, the microphone made a deal with the picture, and made it so her pinballs merely cause players to flicker, not become a stable. Flickering players were more likely to trade the teams during feedback weather, so this was considerably less destructive than its stability. Additionally, at the start of Season 8, the other leaderboard showed three feedback microphone icons next to a sixth, 11th and 18th place rankings. We put the three players most closely related to the microphone on them. Jerry and Otto Fingers, Nan and Six Pack Dog Walker. The three players gained a permanent version of the flickering modification. Nan and Dog Walker also gained the receiver. Immediately after, the programming rituals of these last two players changed three times in rapid succession with messages from, we assume, the microphone. A new feature, the Hall of Frame, was introduced. It let us spend peanuts to pay tribute to dead players. The monitor had referenced it in its first appearance, and now told us, quite simply, that if we wanted to see our friends, presumably the red players, we should give them tiny eggs, or peanuts. Fan favorites instantly shot to the top. Randy Valens, Boyfriend Monreal, Workman Groom, and so on. As fans spent over 10 million peanuts on our grateful dead, and the peanut wasn't happy about that. In its view, we wasted them on a rising otter instead of a shared one. So it gave us strike 4, opening the book at pin 1. Pinut Fraud had been 2, not otherizing its progeny as soon as possible in Season 6 had been 3, and now we had just offended it for the last time. We would find out what this meant in Season 9. So remember the sacrifice? The Tacos started the new season with their entire pitching rotation shared and unable to play. So when the Tacos played their first game, a new player, Pitching Machine, was brought onto the field to, well, pitch for them. What exactly Pitching Machine is, that's up to us fans, and there is a lot of wonderful interpretations. The Tigers have bounded from their disastrous Season 7, won a few good blessings and after a hard-fought series with the Philadelphia Vice, made finals against the Baltimore Cubs and came within two games from Ascension. But the Cubs won again, and Season 9 opened with three teams, the Baltimore Cubs, the Philadelphia Vice and the Eddies Tigers on the verge of Ascension. Potential as a consequence of the fourth strike and the approach of the Pinot God, both Bird's weather and Pinot weather could now cause additional effects. Under Pinot rain, for example, players could get struck by a giant Pinot meteorite and get shelled. This happened, ironically, to Wild Twitter, an unlimited tacos batter, because clearly the team hadn't had enough of their players shelled. This was the first season when the idol ball did not feature an ominous red line. Instead, the monitor's icon followed the most idol as shelled player to eat them, we guessed. The Moist Talkers volunteered Polkadot Patterson for that spot. They felt a kinship to the squid, being a fellow wet being, because, you know, squids and the sea and all that. The monitor tried to eat Dot, but found that the egg had spoiled and simply fed the star pitcher from their shell. While all this was going on, the Baltimore Cubs were set on the path to ascension. In the fourth game of the postseason, Nagoya McDaniels, the best batter in the league by stars and performance, who had been shelled since season 6, returned to the field. She had played for the Cubs on and off, in a bizarre game of player ping pong between them and the Jets ends, but only before Season 6. Now the best batter in all of baseball was leading the strongest team who took the like their ascension run. The Cubs advanced to finals after easily dispatching the Elmont Sunbeams and Houston Vice. They faced the Charleston Shooters, a good, but so far not great, team. The teams had made finals once all the way back in Season 2, but had never gone past Round 1 of playoffs since then. But in the Season 8 elections, they had won a few key blessings and had become strong enough to beat both the Tigers and Garges on their way to their second IRB Finals. Crucially, they were now potentially the strongest defensive team in the league. A strong defense had already proved to be hard for the Cubs to break through. For all their strengths, their contact batting wasn't particularly good. And on day 64, Jerry not took fingers out after feedbacking to the league, joined the Charleston Shooters, rounding out an incredibly solid pitching rotation. The Cubs easily won the first game, squeaked out a second, but the teams managed to grow back the next two. At the bottom of the ninth inning of the last game, the Cubs were up 4-2. But Stuto Roll with a 3 round home run shamed the Cubs and gave it the shoe teams their first IRB title. Before the game properly concluded, just a few seconds after Stu's summer, the screen turned back and showed the following messages Emergency alert, incoming, seek shelter. 
Then Shagduan appeared and delivered an ominous message. I am here and you are out. Come to me, my boys. Heaven will tremble before you. You think you are so tough? You think you have power? We will see. Time to teach you some discipline. This is when baseball becomes a JRPG. The Pinot created its own team, the Shared One Sports, out of every shared player and the three Pinot players. It started a game with the Charleston Shoe Teams, but this was no regular baseball game. Both teams had a health bar, every strikeout, home run, hit, foul and so on damaged the opponent, and they would play until either of them ran out of HP. The game picked the best pitcher on each team for the game, beating Jaren against former Cubs and Firefighters star pitcher Axel Torol. But it was a losing battle. The Pinot God was simply too powerful and easily defeated the teams. It also cursed the team's pitchers with the mild debuff and the run-up with fringe. Mild makes it so that pitchers can throw mild pitches, which are automatically balls that let all base runners advance. Fringe makes it so batters cannot hit until they have at least one strike. The Pinot God had made good on its promise. It had literally taught us great discipline. Season 10 opened with the shared one sports that displayed ominously above the league, and another line appeared, but this time in the of frame. It cut off 14 spots, exactly the same number of players as a regular baseball team. Not only that, 6 spots on the other board were marked by the birds, broad and eclipse weather icons. Finally, another microphone icon appeared next to spot 14. And how could we put anyone there but Jerry and Dog Fingers, who had been revived from that specific spot? Halfway through the season, the Kansas fans decided to put fan favorite Tillman Anderson up on the other leaderboard, specifically next to an Eclipse icon. Tillman had been incinerated back in season 9, and fans may be hoped that the Eclipse weather slot would perhaps reverse the incineration or something of the sort, not surely incinerate him again. Sibyl had discovered, by analyzing the site's code, that something would happen if a dead player was put into a weather slot. So it pushed the fans on, and the icon lit up once Tillman was next to it. Soon, this experiment was repeated with another dead player and it became clear that we were supposed to put our dead and gone up there, otherwise them once again, before the final battle. When the regular season's games ended, Jaren died again. Or, well, she went to the Hall of Fame, swapping with the 14th player there, Tillman Anderson, who came back to life. The Cubs' fans were overjoyed that one of their most consistent hitters had been revived. But, to their immense sadness, he was placing to the rivals the Charleston Shoot Eves as pitching rotation. And Tillman is not a very good pitcher, but he tries and we all love him for it. This, alongside the teams being weakened by fringe and mild pitches, meant they were easily swept by the Cubs when the two once again met in Grand Finals. So I think the Cubs should all say thank you, Tillman Anderson, for finally ascending and completing their narrative arc, going from perhaps the worst team in the league to the best. Or oh, and a little footnote. The Cubs blew up the sun in that finals game. Specifically, the lead of batter, Todd Fox, did so. One of the decrees available for season 10 was Backhaul, which would have done just that. It was winning overwhelmingly by the time the postseason rolled up, so the developers wanted to get tired with their work and it accidentally ended up firing a bit too early. Honestly, once again, I think the bug made the experience better. The sun exploding and a Backhaul appearing is the best way to herald an apocalyptic final battle I can think of. So the bug team of Cubs, as the thieves had done in season 9, Face the Pinot Gold. They didn't last a single inning. This time the Pinot wasn't playing around. A single hit from Wyatt Quitter destroyed the champions. But it wasn't over. The microphone tweeted, Let's go kill gold. And a team of undead players from all over the league was up to face the shared one sports. They were the fan base's favorites, coming back for one last battle. They were the whole stars, buffed by an amount proportional to how many Pinots the fans had given them as a tribute. The fans that saw for them literally propelled them on. They gained bonuses according to which weather icon they were placed next to. Randy Vargas in particular got a fire eater trait. When the field god tried to incinerate him, he ate the frame and channeled it into a home run. Jaren was with the whole stars. She had also gained, from being in the 14th spot, a modification called Freakering. We all it meant that Jaren would switch places with opposing teams as pitcher. And when doing so with the pods, she gained the support hero modification and let the undead players score free omens or hits against the shared ones team. This was instrumental to the All Stars' success, after a hard-fought battle during which Sebastian Telefon, former Dallas Stakes batter, was incinerated for the second time, the All Stars defeated the shared ones pods. The monitor appeared and ate the build gold and said it was kinda brand. The players released from the Pinot's conto were freed and fell down to random teams in the league. The whole stars gained the release modification. They were completely removed from the game. They cannot be otherwise or interacted with in any way. 
They are being freed from baseball, their soul scream has become a soul song. They got what might reasonably be called a happy ending, if such a thing exists in baseball. After all this, the monitor said the boss would be on her way soon. Indeed, a Roman coin appeared on the website and announced the start of a new era. Now the boss, whoever she was, owned baseball, and was going to usher forth an era of peace and prosperity and fair play. This is probably the consequence of the deal the microphone tweeted out, the same one it made to bring the old stars back and defeat the shared one. Could killing one malevolent god have led us into the jaws of another? We don't know yet. How that shakes out remains to be seen. The clubs finally ascended. They disappeared from the IRB and went to another place. To replace them, a new team, the Tokyo Rift, appeared and proceeded to perform terribly because the current teams had been soaking up 10 seasons worth of buffs. There was a widget on the homepage, a telescope which let us see how well the clubs were doing. Apparently they were still playing, but we didn't know I guess who or what they were doing except they were losing every single game. That might be because they lost Nagomi, but their suit on Dreamy and feature Montgomery Bullock to a still blessing to the away Fridays and receive terrible players here too. They finally won on day 50, somehow with Bevan Underbrook, a pretty bad former Fridays pitcher on the mound, assuming the games followed the standard rotation patterns. The Pinute had mentioned the big leagues when the Cubs won season 10. That appeared to be where the team now was, but that's all the information we got. Until, well, someone had the bright idea of trying to go from baseball.com to baseball2.com because, you know, since baseball is so good, they probably made a baseball2. And they did, literally. The developers literally bought the baseball2 domain and all orders from 1 to 10. Not baseball1 though, do not go to baseball1.com. Baseball2 displayed the gaps between two gates in some place high up. What does it mean? We have no idea. Season 11 was very weird. There were only two weathers which affected the number of wins and losses for each game. But the Airmount Sun Beams convincingly won and it feels fitting. The discipline era started with them being renamed. Now they set it off with a championship win. Every team has won one of 20 blessings all named after tarot cards. And we voted on a few changes to a forbidden book whose effects we will probably see in Season 12. Baseball's future is unknown, uncharted, but not uncertain. I know there is so much more baseball still to be played, and so many wonderful stories waiting for us all to write them together. Thanks for watching, this video took an immense amount of work, please share it to someone else you think would be interested in it and, you know, like and subscribe and tell me what your favorite baseball moment is in the comments to increase my engagement rating on the algorithm. Do check out my Patreon for early access and cut content for future videos. I plan to do a lot more baseball and non-baseball related documentaries. Finally, if you enjoy this kind of stuff, since you've already seen everything John Boyce has ever made, come on, you have, right? I would like to recommend Bobby Broccoli, a familiar creator doing stuff in the same style. There's a link to the documentary about a man who almost faked his way to a Nobel Prize as a card in the description. 